When I was really young, probably, I don't know how old I was, fifth grade, fourth grade, I, I started to realize that I was attracted to the same sex, which is a very strange phenomenon to happen. Because especially at the, in, in the 80s, when it was very taboo to have that, that um, to have same-sex attraction. And according to my family, who my, all of my siblings and my parents are Christians, my parents are in heaven now, but according to my family, according to the culture around me, and according to the church, homosexuality was very much you know, taboo and forbidden and sinful. So it was this very deep struggle in my, my soul because on the outside, I was, I was very social in school. Uh, I, and I went steady with girls. In high school, I had three, girl, I had three relationships with, with girls. But I, all, the, all the while, it wasn't re- I knew it wasn't real, and it was just more of a social thing for me. And, uh, and then things, and, and it's, it's uh, that having this, this same-sex attraction thing is like, it, it's a strange phenomenon, because it's like schizophrenia, because I had to, I had to like be a certain way with all of my classmates and friends, and then on the inside, though, I was, you know, had this deep, dark secret, and I couldn't really talk about it or do anything about it. So until in high school, when I was a junior in high school, I went to an all-boys Jesuit school, and I met a sophomore, and he, we immediately be, became best friends. And he, I mean, we, we didn't talk about it at first, but I knew he was same-sex attracted. I could just tell, and he could tell that I was. So we, uh, a few months into our friendship, we came out to each other. And that, once that happened, the floodgates opened, and we started just going to gay bars in Dallas uh, all the time. I, I don't know how we got into these bars, because we were 14 and 15, and we looked even younger than that. So, but you know, gay bars, they're just like, come on in. Um, and so, and then we would go to this nightclub called the Start Club, and it was designed by the French designer Philippe Stark. That he's very famous, and the club was like stunning. It was beautiful, and um, I, I just remember the first time I walked in to the Star Club. There was the whole gamut of of there was you know straight people, gay people, drag queens, uh, transsexuals, and and I remember walking in as a 14, 15 year old, and just going wow, like, these are my people. These are, like, the misfits in life and the artists. And this is, and I felt so at home. It was, like, the first time I felt like people understood me. And so I went to the, (laughs) I went to that club. It was open Thursday night through Sunday night. And I went every Thursday. I I was on the, I immediately, they put me on the guest list. The cover charge was, like, super expensive. But I immediately was put on the guest list, like, the first day. So I didn't have to pay, and I didn't have to wait in this very long line. And um, I would go every night that it was open. My, fr- my friend and I would go, and I would stay out till 5 in the morning. And my parents had no clue. They, I, I was the youngest of eight kids, so they, by the time they got to me, they were completely checked out. And <laughs> for better, for worse... And, uh, you know, I was making straight A's in high school, so they didn't really notice that I was out all night. And um, the same thing, so it was nice. It was In high school, it was nice to have a confidant, a son, like a best friend I could talk about these things with that, you know, we could share this together. And uh, the same thing happened when I went away to college. The first day of college, I met this guy, and we ended up becoming best friends same thing. Like, he was dealing with same-sex attraction. I was dealing with it. We weren't out. uh, Because I thought, you know, I thought, this is just kind of a phase I'm going through, and, you know, eventually I'll get get married to a woman and have a family, but for now, like, this is what I want. And, And it was, so it wasn't my identity yet. 
it didn't become my identity identity till later, which we'll talk about talk about. But so it was nice again in college to have a, a friend who you know we could talk about this stuff in secret and nobody really knew. And uh, but then after college, my best friend and I we were having kind of like a, a life crisis about you know what are we going to do with our lives because uh, the, there were just too many options. And so I, we both ap applied to grad schools and law school, and I was enrolled in law school, and, but I didn't really want to go. Um, my dad was a lawyer, but I, I didn't want to go because I was like, I, I don't want to be a lawyer. That sounds like a terrible <laughs> career. And so my best friend said, let's move to Tokyo for a year and just kind of figure things out. And I'm like, okay. So we moved to Japan. And that, that was an, uh, kind of an incredible experience. Um, and I, I loved living in Tokyo. And uh, about eight months into to my time in Tokyo, my roommate, my roommate's friend from Texas came to visit him. And he stayed with us in our tiny Tokyo apartment uh, for five days. And by the end of five days, much to my surprise, because it really came out of nowhere. Like, I just realized on the you know fourth day, I was like, I'm in love with this guy, and it was the first time I had experienced that kind of strong romantic emotion. And we, he and I, got into a relationship uh, for two years, and um, so that was when homosexuality became my identity. That's when I was like, okay, this is who I am for sure, and this will be who I am for the rest of my life. And I was, ha I was thrilled about it. Like, I was just like shouting it from the rooftops, you know, like, I'm gay. And while I was in Japan, my sister had written me a letter asking if I was gay, because she had her suspicions for a while, and um, I wrote her back this long epistle, the, the epistle to Rachel, and um, I told her, you know, I explained everything about what it means to be gay and kind of like all of the different aspects of it. And at the end, I said, P.S., don't tell mom and dad. I'll tell them when I get home. But of course, like she got my letter and immediately ran to my entire family and told them. Thank you, Rachel. So um, and then so I I was actually happy about that because she did the heavy lifting for me. I didn't have to have the awkward moment with my parents, like, mom, dad, have a seat. I need to tell you something. So, they, so when I got back from Tokyo, they already knew. And the first night I got back, I walked into the kitchen, and my mother and I were very, very close. Surprise. And um, uh, I walked into the kitchen, and she started crying. And I knew why she was crying. And I, so I was like, mom, what's wrong? And she said, well, I, I, I heard you're a homosexual. And, and, um, and, and she was terrified because at that time, this was 1992, at that time, AIDS was like a death sentence. And she was terrified. I was terrified. I mean, it was, it was a scary time. And, and I just tried to allay her fears. And I was like, Mom, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about me. It's, this is just who I am. And, and, um, and then that was the last we spoke of it. My mother, that, I mean, my mother was a very strong Christian, and my father. And that's the last we spoke of it. And, 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 I'll, and we'll get to, to what happened later. But the next day, my dad came up to me, and he said, hey, Beck, I, you know, I heard you're homosexual. And, and my dad was like a man's man. I mean, this was like, <laughs> so thankfully, he had, you know, five other sons, you know, that, that played sports and stuff. But um, so <laughs> I didn't have that pressure. But my dad said, you know, is there anything I did wrong? As a father? Are you angry at me for, you know, X, Y, and Z? And I was like, no, dad, it's not your fault. This is just who I am. And it turns out it kind of was his fault. But distant father, overbearing mother. And, um, and so that was it. And my parents, they were very just, they were so lovely about it. I mean, I had no idea what their reaction was going to be. But they were just... They were super loving towards me, and they didn't like have they didn't have a meltdown or, you know, 
kick me out of the house or whatever. Um, and so I decided to not go to law school, much to the chagrin of my father. <laughs> And two weeks, two weeks before law school started, I just, I said, Dad, I'm moving to L.A. And he was like, huh? He was so confused by it. But I mean, at that point, he was just like, whatever. Um, so I loaded up my truck and moved to Beverly Hills, that is. Uh, swimming pools, movie stars. And so some people get that and some people don't. But um, <laughs> So I moved to LA and it was great. I mean, when I got to LA, I had this built-in group of friends because my closest friends, a few of my closest friends from high school went to Brown University in Princeton and one went to Harvard. And, and so they, their, for all of their friends from school moved out to LA who, were, who wanted to be in show business, basically. So when I got to LA, I had this whole group of friends and they were smart, ambitious, very funny, um, and there were women, men, straight people, gay people. It was a whole mix of people, and it was, I mean, they were such, such a fun crowd. They, they're actually, they run Hollywood today, so like whatever <laughs> movies or TV you see, a lot, those are my friends who produce or create or act in those, those things, and, um, and so we all wanted the same, we all wanted the same things. Uh, by the way, none of my friends, like, we never mentioned God. God, God was, it was just implicit, it was tacitly understood that God didn't exist. Like, there were, we didn't even have to say the word God. So we never once spoke about God. We never once spoke about what happens to you when you die. Like, it was just assumed. Like, we were materialists. Like, we just believed we're here, and then we die, and that's it. And so... Um, well, yeah, we wanted three things in life. To make it big in Hollywood, which all my friends were doing uh, in real time in the 90s. It was crazy to watch my friends go from kind of obscurity to movie star, like, overnight. It was like Minnie Driver was a close friend. She, she, um, she did, like, this one movie with Chris O'Donnell called Circle of Friends, and it wasn't, it was kind of a flop. And and then she, she did Goodwill Hunting with Matt Damon, and of course, she was nominated for an Oscar. Uh, but so we, it was just like, all, this was happening to all of my friends. Like, the, the ones who were directors were, were becoming hugely big directors. Like, a, a friend of mine directed Swingers, this movie Swingers with Vince Vaughn, and... Um, it became this huge hit, and now, and then he went on to all the Born Identity movies and all. But this was all like Mar Mariska Hargitay was. I was her best gay. She would call me her best gay, <laughs> and she, uh, you know, she was Jane Mansfield's daughter, but she wasn't really. She did, you know, a couple episodes. She did an episode of Seinfeld, and like she did some other, you know, uh, guest star appearances, but um, she wasn't really, you know, famous. And then she had a, got an audition for Law and Order Special Victims Unit, and I drove with her to the audition to, and I, because she wanted me to help her with our, to rehearse her lines. And then she ended up getting the part, and she's still doing the show 25 years later, 23 years later, she's still the star of the show. And uh, I, she, I mean, I think she kind of owes me royalties at this point. Um, but, so I was, so, uh, and I was, you know, hanging out. I, because all my friends were in the business, we were, and that's the other thing, we all wanted to, the, other, the second thing, we all wanted to have these extraordinary experiences. Because that, that's what I kind of thought life was about, because there was no God. So it's like, okay, life is about having really amazing experiences. Like, this is what it is, the purpose of life. And, and the, we were doing that in spades because my friends were all in the business. So we were always invited to uh, film premieres on Thursday nights and the Oscars, the Emmys, the Golden Globes, the Grammys. And I would go to all these events and there were always after parties, the HBO party, the, the um, Vanity Fair party after the Oscars, the um, Governor's Ball after the Oscars, 
which I went to and had dinner with Tom Hanks, Meryl Streep, and all these. I met everyone, knew everyone, was friends with her. It was just, uh, and um, I would hang out at Drew Barrymore's house and swim in, in her amazing pool, and uh, Paris Hilton's house, I would hang out with her. Um, so I, and then one, like one night, <laughs> This is just like every night there was something else. And one night my friend called me and he's like, hey, do you want to go to Prince's house tonight? He's like, there's a small party at his house. His like gigantic, crazy, it was, gi- it was like a football stadium. Um, and I, I remember walking into his house and it, there was like, uh, everything was purple. And there was like this crazy kind of Batman piano looking thing in the corner. But and I, we, I walked outside in the back, and the back lawn was huge. It was like a, like a football field. And at the end of it was his stage with his big sign. And I was like, oh, he's going to perform tonight. So he, he performed a concert for three hours for like 50 people. It was amazing. <clears throat> and um, so that was my life. I just was constantly surrounded by shiny objects, by fun times, and... Um, and it was all great until it wasn't because after the law of diminishing returns set in and, you know, after, I don't know, years and years, since high school, years and years of doing these things and going to fabulous parties and meeting everyone and going to dinners and this and that and awards, fashion weeks in New York and Paris, like, that w- it was all so much fun, but uh, it all came to a head at Paris Fashion Week in March of 2009. I, w- I went to that Fashion Week that year, and I went to a bunch of the runway shows, and most of the shows have after parties, and I was at this pr- one after party. The whole fashion world was there. It was at this club called Regine in the middle of Paris, this legendary club, and... Kanye West was there, everyone was there. And so I was sitting with Rachel Zoe and her husband, Roger. Rachel Zoe is like a TV fashion girl. Um, And we were sitting on this kind of deck above the dance floor and drinking champagne. And I was, I remember I got up and kind of stood up and was looking at the crowd and everyone was allegedly, you know, having the time of their lives, right? And and this was like, you know, everyone from the fashion world, designers and actors and models. And, and um, I just felt this overwhelming sense of emptiness. I was like, whoa, where did that come from? And I was like, how am I going to sustain myself for the rest of my life? Like all these, other, these things I've been doing since high school, they've sustained me and they've, they've kept me afloat and entertained and distracted for years and years, but now that's not the case anymore. So I went back to my, um, I ghosted the party, went back to my, the, the, the apartment I had rented, and I was up all night in a panic about my, my life. Like, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? I mean, am I going to be put out to pasture like <laughs> all older gay men in Palm Springs? Like, what's going what's to what's gonna happen to me? Like, that's... It's a true story. That's what happens to gays in LA. Um, so I, a couple days later, I get back. I fly back to LA. I get busy with work. At that point, I was a production designer in Hollywood, in in the fashion world, and uh, I get back to work. And so, and when you're in production, it just takes over your life. Like you, you can't. There's not, You can't think about anything else. So I kind of forgot about that night a little bit in Paris and. But cut to six months later, or before I get to that, so I, I wanted to know the meaning of life. I mean, everyone does. So, but God was never an option for me because I was gay. So I was like, well, that's not an option. God doesn't exist uh, for me. And so I looked for meaning in several places, but a couple of them first was I would go to plays all the time, to to the theater all the time in New York and London. I um, would go to really, really serious plays. I didn't like 
comedies or musicals. But I, I went to serious plays by like Tom Stopper, Eugene O'Neill, Harold Pinter, Tony Kushner, who wrote, Tony Kushner wrote Angels in America, and the, the subtitle of the play is A Gay Fantasia with Political Themes. And it's a six hour play. And I saw the first three hours in London and the second three hours on Broadway. And um, I mean, it, the play, like at the time I, I saw the play, I was like, oh, this is so deep, it's amazing. And now it's like, I look at it now and I'm like, it's total gibberish, like it, it's meaningless. Um, so don't, don't watch Angels in America. Um, <clears throat> but I would always leave the theater frustrated because I, was, I always thought, well, these guys are so smart, these playwrights. Surely they have the, you know, surely they have some sort of insight into the meaning of life, but they didn't. And I would leave, like it would, like the play would come so close to truth or something re resembling truth, but then it would just kind of evaporate, and I would leave frustrated all the time. The other thing I was, I was art was my religion sort of, and so I, I loved. Uh, anytime I was in New York. Uh, London, Paris, uh, I, I, I would just spend the entire day going to museums, every day. I, I was just, I was an art junkie. And, um, and one time at the, and I was, in, I was very obsessed, I was obsessed with contemporary art, especially. And at, I, one time I was at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the contemporary art museum there. And and there was an exhibition by Yves Klein, and it was it was five empty galleries within the museum, and it was just hardwood floors with white painted walls. And I was like, this is brilliant. Oh my gosh, it's genius, like negative space. Like so like I that I I loved art and uh and that sort of kind of you know gave me a jolt of kind of meaning for a momentary, just for a moment. And, but not, neither of those things really ultimately, obviously, satisfied. So um, anyway, I get back to LA. Six months later, I'm at a coffee shop. Um, my friend, my best friend who, who's gay, he and I every weekend did the same thing. We would go to brunch in Venice in the morning and then we would go shopping in Beverly Hills or West Hollywood, which is gay church, brunch and shopping. And then we would go to a coffee shop. <laughs> it's true. Um, and then we'd go to this coffee shop on the east side of L.A. called Intelligentsia. And uh, we, lo we would hang out because we had a ton of friends in that area. And so we would see people and it was fun. It was like beautiful weather all the time. And that particular Sunday we were there, we were chatting and drinking our cappuccinos, just casually minding our own business. And then we look over and there's a table next to us with five young people and five physical Bibles on the table. And we were shocked. I had never seen a Bible in public in LA. Um, my friend was culturally Jewish and we, I, I, it was crazy to say, especially in this part of town, because Silver, it was in Silver Lake, which is very progressive. It's extremely progressive. So to see Bibles, it was just like, what in the world? And um, so my friend loved to sort of stir up trouble. And he's like, he's like, ask them what they're doing. And I was like, no. And anyway, he convinced me to, and I finally turned to them, and it's like a Christian's fantasy come true when a gay atheist says, hey, are you guys Christians? What's the gospel? <laughs> That's literally what I said to them. I mean, <laughs> how easy does it get? So um, they, um, they were very knowledgeable, and, and they told me what they believed and what, what the gospel was, and and they said they, they were evangelical Christians, and they went to a church on, in Hollywood on Sunset. And um, they, and of course, I get to the question, the $64,000 question. I said, well, what does your church believe about homosexuality? And they said, well, we, be, we believe it's a sin. And I wasn't surprised by their response. I, I expected that. 
I was surprised by my reaction because <laughs> like a year before that, 10 years before that, I would have just said, well, you guys are crazy and it was nice talking to you, but I'm leaving now. But because of that night in Paris six months before, I was open to hearing something else. And I had this flash of this kind of like, well, what if God does exist? I mean, there is a slim chance he does. And but because by that time I was a full atheist, I, I thought the Bible, all, my, we, all of my friends did, I just, I thought the Bible was an ancient myth like any other ancient myth. And I said, what if God does exist? What if homosexual behavior is a sin? And what if I built my life on a false foundation and I don't know it? And so they invited me to their church the following Sunday. And I was like, I don't know. I, this is weird. Just give me the address and I'll think about it. So I had a whole week to think it through. And it was, it was very risky because if any of my friends, besides the one I was with that day, if any of my other friends knew that I was going to an evangelical church, they would have thought I was crazy because evangelicals were the enemy to i mean they were just the absolute enemy they were like somewhere to the right of attila the hun you know and so um so i the, i thought about it the whole week and i was like should i do this and i don't know and but the following sunday rolled around and i woke up and i just was like i guess i'm gonna it felt like I, it felt like I was in a self-driving Tesla. It was like I had no, it was, it was like the car just drove me to this auditorium where it meets, the church meets in a high school auditorium. And so I get there and I, I remember consciously before I walked into the service, I put, I, in my mind, I put homosexuality in this imaginary white box and I just put it on the shelf like an imaginary shelf. And I was like, I'm just going to go in with an open mind. And, and when I got there, this greeter, this woman was one of the greeters, and she said, hi, welcome, we love you. And I was like, huh? What are you talking about? <laughs> and so that, was, that kind of threw me off a little bit. And then I walked in, I heard the Christian worship band playing, and I was like, oh, Christian music, I forgot that existed. Ooh, weird. And I was like, no, it's actually beautiful. It's nice. And so I sat down on the fourth row on the aisle by myself, and the pastor comes out, and he starts preaching on Romans chapter 7. And I, it was while he was preaching for an hour, the strange, strangest thing starts happening to me. Um, Every word he's saying, every sentence he's saying is resonating as truth in my mind and my heart, and I don't know why. And I'm like, what is he saying? And I was literally on the edge of my seat, like riveted to the sermon. And I'm like, this, what is he saying? Like, this is crazy. And I didn't want him to stop. After an hour of preaching, I was like, just keep talking. Like, this is amazing. And it was the first time in my life that I truly un heard and understood the gospel. And I was like, this is good news. This is crazy. And so he, after he finished his sermon, he said, there, there's people on the side of the auditorium if you want prayer for anything. Um, and, and then there's another 30 minutes of worship time, worship music. And so <clears throat> I walk over, reluctantly, I walked over to the side of the church and I went up to this guy and I said, hi, I... I don't know what I believe, but I'm here. And he said, okay, let me pray for you. And he laid hands on me when that was still legal in California. And <laughs> he prayed for me. And I was like, why does this random straight dude care about me so much? Because his prayer was so full of love and care. And I was just like, wow. And it was so powerful. And I thanked him, went back to my seat. And there, so there was another 25 minutes of worship music. I sit, everyone else is standing singing. I sat down because I was just like so freaked out by the sermon, the music, the prayer. And as soon as I sit down, the Holy Spirit just goes. <laughs> and it was like a road to Damascus like moment. And in my mind, God said, it was just like as clear, it was, it was like as real as this. 
pulpit. Um, God said, I'm God. Uh, I'm God, Jesus is my son, heaven is real, hell is real, the Bible's true, welcome to my kingdom. And I was like, whoa! And I, it was like Isaiah in the temple when he sees the holiness of God and just falls apart. I just started bawling. Like, I never cried that hard in my life since I was an infant, which made sense because I was just born again, so I was a new infant in Christ. And um, I was doubled over just bawling and bawling, and I was crying over the conviction of sin, but also the joy of meeting Jesus Christ, and finally knowing the meaning of life. Like, it was, it was, I, it was like the curtains parted, and I could finally see the meaning, the truth, the reality. It was like, like Plato's cave, you know, and, and this is a little, uh, I'm diverging, but in Plato's cave, the allegory of Plato's cave, there, um, there are these, these, People that are chained to, since since their since childhood, they're chained to this bench basically, and they can't move their heads. And they're in a in a cave, and behind them is a a fire, and and there's also a wall behind them. And there are people who are kind of like puppeteers who are who are casting shadows on the wall of like animals or whatever vases so people the these these prisoners in plato's cave all they can see their entire lives all they see are shadows on the wall and so that they believe so they believe that's what reality is that they, they think that's what reality is until one of the prisoners breaks free go, climbs out of the cave and onto you know the earth and sees that there's trees and and that there's people and that there's colors and and he's like completely and that's what and he's completely blown away by it and he goes back to the cave to tell the other prisoners you guys they're like this is that's not reality the shadows aren't reality this is reality's up in you know above earth and that's what um that and and they try to kill him because and this is just like what, what it's like to be a Christian. It's like, that's what it was like for me. It's like coming out of Plato's cave into reality. Like, I thought the shadows were reality my whole life. But then once Jesus revealed himself to me, I knew that, no, no this is reality. And it's funny because my church is called Reality LA. Um, anyway, that was just a side note on Plato's cave. So I've just... Uh, I'm just going to, oh, and then, so after the, after the service, after I cried for 25 minutes, uh, doubled over, heaving, I get home after the service, and it happens again. I'm, and I try to take a nap, because I'm just so freaked out by what just, all this stuff that happened. And I get in my bed, and as soon as I get in my bed, God's like, let me show you some more of my glory. And I was like, whoa. And I just burst into tears. And I, and I jumped out of my bed in the middle of my bedroom. And I said, God, you have my whole life. I'm yours. I'm done. That's it. And I knew <clears throat> in that moment, I knew that homosexual behavior was a sin. I knew it was wrong. I knew that dating guys was no longer part of my future, but I didn't care because I had just met Jesus. And I'm like, I'm going with that guy. Good riddance to that old life. And that was September 20th, 2009. And I've never looked back. Praise the Lord. Yes. And so I want to answer a couple, a few questions that I, common questions I get before we get to the, your, your questions. Um, these are some questions I get a lot, um, <clears throat> and I'll start with this one. You know, but aren't you born gay, and didn't God create you gay? Like, how could it be wrong if God created you gay? Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, so there's three main theories about why a human being develops same-sex attraction. One is pre a genetic predisposition. One is uh, hormonal in utero. So like it, it, when I was in my mother's womb, maybe I got too much progesterone instead of testosterone, whatever. Uh, and then the third, third uh, theory is 
environmental, so distant father, overbearing mother kind of thing. Nobody knows the answer to this question. <clears throat> I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I could have very, very well been born gay. That could, have, that could be the case. But it's a moot point because we're all born in sin. We're, not, we're conceived in sin. So because of the fall, we are all born broken in, in, every, in all sorts of ways, including our genetic coding. So, and so even if like a scientist, uh, on, in the New, if, even if the New York Times had a cover story today that said scientist discovers gay gene, I would say, so what? Like, we're, our genetic coding is corrupted by, <clears throat> by the fall and by sin. And so, <clears throat> sorry, but we're all, uh, every human being is born with sinful, innate impulses, but that doesn't mean we act on those impulses. And so <clears throat> that, it's a moot point whether you're, so God did, God did not create me gay. He did not create you gay. It's, this is a result of the fall and uh, the, the corruption of the fall. And secondly, can you be gay and Christian? Well, um, this is, obviously this has kind of become a big deal in, in evangelical churches even, uh, in our society. Oh, yeah, and there's gay churches, which doesn't make any sense to me, because um, a gay Christian to me is, is like a square circle or an elderly baby. It just doesn't, ex you, it doesn't exist. You can't have it. And um, I just want to read First John really quick. He says, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. No one... Um, no one who abides in Christ keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. No one born of, of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed ab uh, abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. So that's the problem with this particular sin, is that it's become such a powerful identity in our culture. It's gone from a behavior... 60 years ago, 50 years ago, to an identity, it's gone from a sin to a sacrament. And um, there's very specific reasons why that's happened, which we don't have time to get into, maybe in the question and answer. But, <clears throat> um, and so the, you, that's, that's the problem with, in our culture today, homosexuality is not only seen as good, but even righteous and even holy. And so if you believe that and, you engage, and you're just engaged in homosexual behavior for the rest of your life or you get married to a man or whatever, then you have no chance of repenting of that. And without repentance, there's no salvation. So it, you can't, basically the bottom line is you can't be a gay Christian. Now there are some, this is happening in um, our churches now, where this is kind of infiltrating the church now, that uh, it's called Side B Christianity. And I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's um, basically it's, it's, it's genuine Christians who are, you know, ex gay, whatever you want to call it. Genuine Christians, but they still call themselves gay Christians or queer Christians which makes no sense to me because that's my old man. I'm a new creation in Christ. Why would I drag some corpse around with me uh, and identify as a gay Christian? Plus, it's like putting the profane and the sacred together, gay Christian. And so I, I, this is spreading throughout evangelical churches, like this idea of being a sexual. They also, it's, the movement is called Revoice. And they, can, they also consider themselves sexual minorities. There's no such thing as a sexual minority. There's only sexual sin. Like, that's it. There's no... Um, and so, beware, just beware of that, that whole movement. Um, and the, the last... Well, let's see. Uh, 
A lot of people, when I got saved, a friend of mine, a really close friend of mine, this, this woman, she asked me, we were having this conversation, I was telling her about the whole thing, and she was like, well, isn't it unfair, Beckett, that you can't, you have to be single for the rest of your life, and you can't have a partner, like, you can't have a boyfriend, or isn't that unfair? And I'm like, no. Uh, first of all, I'm not alone. I have <clears throat> a relationship with the king of the universe, and it's the best relationship I've ever been in. He'll never leave or forsake me, unlike my ex-boyfriends who, you know, my five ex-boyfriends who all did. Um, and so I've never once, like, felt like so, uh, my life's unfair or I've been cheated out of something. I feel the opposite. I feel like the luckiest guy in the world, that I get to be in the kingdom of God and have eternal life, which is, you know, kind of a big deal. Um, and so what's unfair is Jesus had to be tortured, beaten, and crucified for my sins. That's unfair. So, I, yeah, life is not unfair. Uh, and let's see, we have one, oh, 58 seconds. Um, but yeah, let's just go into, let's go into, I just want to read one verse from uh, 2 Timothy, where is it? And this, you know, this is what's happening. He said, Paul says, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So that's what's happening in the church right now. And um, it's, it's just bizarre to me because, I mean, and I, I, we could do a whole, uh, another talk on, on, the, on what the Bible says about homosexuality, but the Bible couldn't be clearer. And, um, and uh, so, yeah. But I have an episode on my, I have a couple episodes about that on my show, so why, you can go watch it. Um, so let me just pray. God, thank you so much for this time. Thank you um, for your mercy on us, Lord. Thank you for your salvation, your grace. We ask for more of it, Lord. We ask for more of your spirit. And I pray for anyone here, God, who's struggling with this, who's going through this and their families or whatever, God, I pray that you would just give them so much grace to handle this. And if someone is struggling with this same-sex attraction, I pray, Lord, that you would help them, God, and help them to see, Jesus, that you are worth everything. Um, like the, the pearl of great price. You're, you're worth everything, Jesus. And so I just pray that you would make that so clear to them that this life is a mist, it's a vapor, it's fleeting, it's over in a second, and eternity is very long. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Lord, for this time, and we bless you and, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank yeah. you so much, Beckett. Um, he's going to join me here on the stage for a Q&A. Uh, the phone number is on the screen. If you have a question uh, for him, please text that number. It'll be sent to me, and then we will, uh, we will discuss it. And then are we close enough? I know you mentioned that earlier, Angelo. Great. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's get right to it. Um, you know, you, you mentioned your, your dad a few times at the beginning there, and you made a comment about it, hit, you know, it was his fault. Um, could you <laughs> may, maybe explain that a little more? You, you mentioned demonstrative mom, distant dad. Um, what, is, what does that mean, and uh, how's that relationship now with, well, I know they've passed away, but how was it when, when you were saved? And, um, yeah. yeah. Um, I... Yeah, my, my dad, he, you know, I was, he had eight kids. <laughs> so, and I was the youngest. So when it came to me, there was no, he didn't have time to spend with me. There was no time. Like Every was, dad in this church that has more than one kid just felt that. So that's, <clears throat> yeah, that's great. There's no time. And so I never got like that love from him or that um, affirmation or he, you know, he, or like Beckett, hey Beckett, I'm proud of you. Like you're, I, as a little boy, I never got that from him. 
I always tell people if they have sons, if, if they don't want their sons to be gay, just like the father, just like pour, just hold them and love them as much as they can and tell them like, you're, I love you, I love you, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of you, like that. Because I never got that from my dad. And, and then my mother, um, I was kind of like my mother's surrogate husband because my dad was so busy all the time. And, and um, so she would turn to me because I was like the sensitive child and she would turn to me for comfort and which is such a, a toxic situation codependent co-despondent um and so I you know I spent more time with my mother and like doing stuff with her than my I never did stuff with my father ever um but he was my father was great he was a great dad uh I mean he was <clears throat> he provided a very secure kind of environment for us as kids and you know it was like I lived in the same house my whole life and went to the same schools and so there wasn't like chaos or anything but um I don't know I honestly still to this day I don't know if that made me gay or not I, I really don't so I I don't blame them um they did the best they could and uh I have but I have no idea because my you know it didn't make my other brothers gay um, and although he probably gave them more attention, I don't know. So I, I, I don't really know the answer to, to why that happened. And how did that relationship change <clears throat> once you were saved and you're talking to them about Jesus and your relationship? Cause you mentioned that they were saved, that they were strong Christians. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I told my mom, because, well, we could talk about the prayer, but my yeah. mom was so, she had such strong faith and she was praying for me for so many years that when I told her I was a Christian, she was like, I know. Like, she was just so, like, casual about it. I was like, Mom, this is huge. And I, my dad, this is really funny. My dad, um, for, he, he never, he, out of all my siblings and my family members, everyone called me to just, and they were just, like, in shock and couldn't believe that I was a Christian. They were bawling, my siblings, all of them, my, my sisters-in-law, brothers-in-law, everyone. My dad never called me. And it was a weird thing. And it was like, I found out later that he thought, he was worried it, it was going to be like parable of the sower. He, he was worried it was going to be snatched away or something. <clears throat> and um, finally, after, I don't know, eight months, I was in Dallas, and it was, it was kind of this brilliant God moment where God set it up that my dad and I were in his house, just the two of us alone, and, and we were just talking, and I said, Dad, how are you doing, you know, and he's like, oh, I'm falling down in the court. My dad was like 80 years old and still practicing law and like falling down in the courthouse. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, you know, and he's, he started saying, you know, complaining about this thing and like my shoulder, this, my back hurts and this, I'm having problem with this or, and I said, well, let me pray for you. Cause I was on the prayer team at my church for years. And so I was so just accustomed or not for years. Cause that was, no, I was on the prayer team, but praying for someone was just totally natural for me at that point. And I had never prayed for my dad, like, in my life. And I just said, Dad, let me pray for you. And I laid hands on my dad, and um, I prayed for him, just like I would pray for anyone. And after I finished praying for him, he, he turned around and looked at me, and he's like, Beck, you have the Holy Spirit. I'm like, I know, Dad. I've been trying to tell you that. <laughs> so, yeah, he was, he, was he was so happy for me. He was like, I'm so happy for you. Um, how do you engage, how, how does a conservative, evangelical, biblical Christian engage the gay community? Um, if there are some here who have friends that are married to, they're in a same-sex relationship, married to the same sex, how do they approach them with the gospel, with grace and truth? Any, any recommendations on how to, to bring the word to them? Um, it's, be, it's becoming more and more difficult given the culture we're in because as soon as you say anything about Christianity, I mean, they're just like, <laughs> like the door closes. But 
uh, I think, I mean, I think a lot, I used to do this on, when I was working on the set of shoots, photo shoots, Bef when I would arrive on the set, before I got out of my car, I would pray, and I would be like, God, just lead me to the person here or persons that you want me to talk to today. And I, it was crazy, like every time he would. And I would just be like, pro like tell, pro proclaiming the gospel to everyone on the set. I was like, I was on this one shoot. I was on <laughs> this, this uh, I did a shoot for Ugg Boots. Um, and uh, I worked for them one time for a week. It was a week-long shoot. And so after a few days, the, the agency director, the director of the agency who hired me for the shoot, she was like, she was Jewish, and she said, because my, my assistants were all, were, they went to my church, so we were all Christians, and, and we were just talking about God the whole time. And, and she, she, um, she said, is everyone here religious or something? And I'm like, yeah, well, we're Christians. And she was so fascinated by that. And, and, uh, and then on the next shoot, like months later, we did another UGG shoot, and we were in Malibu shooting at this house on the beach, and, and she said, oh, we got to get this shot. The, the light is going down. Like, it's, this is, like, it would be a sin not to get the shot, she said. And she said, oh, Beckett, you know all about sin, don't you? And I said, actually, I do. <laughs> and the entire set, all the people on the set turned and looked at me, and it was like silent. And I said, right now, all of you are dead in your trespasses and sins, but I'm alive in Christ. And they're like, what? <laughs> and, they, and I told them, you know, kind of the gospel really quickly. And then the head of, uh, the head of UGG, or the, the, um, the, the client from UGG, she, she was hilarious. She just was like, uh, I'm going to go get some coffee. And but the crazy part about that is, is they kept hiring me over and over after that. Like, they, I, I, thought, I thought this is the last Free time. Ugg boots for the rest of your I, life. I did get free oh, Ugg wow. boots all the time, yeah. Um, but they, uh, yeah, they, that was, but that's what I was like after. But in terms of, in, in terms of like, the gay community, I mean, there's no difference, really. I was going to say, it just sounds like you're bringing the gospel to a people, it's regardless just, of what yeah, the people it's are like doing. It's, 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 the it's people are going to either be receptive or not. Like, there's no special trick to, you know, to gays. It's like, just... <laughs> It's like it's just like anyone else. Anyone else who's lost, you it's just however God leads you, however the Holy Spirit leads you. But I again I would also pray beforehand whenever you're in those situations and, and ask God to give you, you know, the words to, to say. Uh, there's a question on here and I'm gonna try to reword it a little bit. Um, we all as Christians have to count the cost of discipleship. Matthew 16, 24, you know, you need to deny yourself, shoulder a cross, and follow him. And we deny self, we deny sin, those things that beset us, those weights and trappings of this world. So for somebody to say that they are homosexual, that they are in gay relationships, mm -hmm. but believe in Jesus, uh, believe in God, and have some sort of understanding of the Bible, yet still are living in sin and don't fully want to follow God according to his word uh, because of what his word says about their sin, you would say that they're not Christians. Well, there, I mean, there's uh, different options. Uh, there's three options. Number one, because this happened at my church. Number one, uh, this gay couple, this two, these two guys were coming to my church for a year and didn't know that yeah. it, it was a sin. Right. They just didn't know. Right. And this, and finally, this one, the one of the guys in the, uh, was convicted by the sermon, and he ended up breaking up the relationship, and now is like an amazing Christian. Um, the second thing is backsliding. I mean, someone could be in a backslidden state in living that, and they need to repent of that. And the third is like someone who just believes homosexual behavior is totally fine. And that's, that's the real danger. And, and again, I mean, 
it's like, what do you want your life to be? You know, when, when you meet Christ on the last day, what do you want him to say? <laughs> I mean, we're all going to meet him on the last day, whether you believe that or not. It's going to happen. And he's either going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant, or depart from me, I never knew you. And those are like, I, <clears throat> I, my ex, an ex-boyfriend in New York, I texted, we, he knows, you know, he knows my whole story. I told him right after I got saved, um, and he got really kind of hostile to me uh, about it. But then we were, we're still good friends. We're still friends. Uh, we don't see each other very much. But I texted him and I said, I said, Chris, on the last day, you're going to understand how much I loved you. And um, so it's like, and I talk about this all, you know, like we, in this culture, we're so obsessed with ourselves and consumed with ourselves. And it's like, Jesus was single and Paul was single and Paul was running around the Mediterranean planting churches. He didn't care. He was like beaten and tortured and crucified, uh, not crucified, beaten and shipwrecked and jailed and uh, was just, he had a hard life. But all he cared about was getting the gospel out to people. He wasn't, he didn't care about his own life. Um, you know, one of my favorite verses I, is I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And if we change our kind of, uh, change our mindset to, instead of looking inward and saying, woe is me, like my life's hard, and, and focus outward and, and say, how can I, how can I uh, help with the Great Commission? And how can I, sh- you know, share the gospel with people? How can I, you know, help people not be in eternal torment. Like that's that should be the the mindset and the the way we focus, the way we see this. What would you say to somebody who um, who is gay, who is not? Ju- they are practicing um, homosexuality, understands that it's sin, understands what Christ has done, um, may even have an understanding of the gospel to them. But the cost of discipleship is just too much for them to bear, specifically because they're going to have to let go of what they believe is a true part of themselves. Uh, I don't want to be a celibate. I, I, I'm attracted to the same sex, and I want to be with the same sex. Mm-hmm. And, and Christ is having me deny that. How in the world could, could I do that? I don't want to be lonely. What, what would you say to that person who may even be here now that that just the cost of discipleship is, is just too heavy and, and it's just not worth it, especially as a man who's looking back at his life yeah. and decades of, of, of that life and who can truly say it's not worth it. Yeah, I mean, Jesus says this in the Gospels. He says, you know, count the cost. If you want, if you be, if you want to be my disciple, count the cost. Don't start building a building and not finish it because you'll be laughed at and... Um, because it is costly. It is costly to follow Christ. You'll, you're going to lose friends. I, I, lost, uh, I, lost fr- I lost a ton of friends, and I lost my career because of it. And <clears throat> um, However, I don't want to diminish that, that it is hard. It's hard, especially this particular sin, because it, uh, unlike other sins like like gossip or, you know, uh, whatever. Unlike other sins, this sin feels like such a core part of who you are. And it's really, and sexual, sexuality is such a powerful emotion. It's, a, it's, it's probably the, the most powerful human emotion. So uh, it's really hard to give that up. But... Christ is infinitely worth it. I mean, he's, he's so worth it. He just is. And following Jesus is better than everything else in this world pales in comparison to following Christ. Everything else in this world is just like junk compared to him. So, yeah. Uh, Beckett, in your book, um, and then you said a little bit uh, this, this uh, morning, you know, when you went to Reality uh, L.A., and uh, Tim, Tim Chaddock mm-hmm. was, was preaching there. And uh, he's preaching through Romans 6? 7. seven. Um, 
you know, I wonder if after that, after your conversion, and now you're walking into discipleship, baptism, and so on, I don't, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think they had some sort of special ministry no. to those coming out of the homosexual lifestyle now being a Christian. Yeah. So if that's true, and it is, how then did the church love you well, disciple you well, as being now a redeemed man who was gay? How, how did they do that without having a, you need to come on Tuesday nights at two o'clock to our, or two, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, um, I always think those things are dangerous, and my pastor does too. He thought, though, like, because some, sometimes people would say, oh, we need to have a gay, you know, group, like, support group. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> that is, like, a disaster waiting to happen when you get a bunch of, like, guys together who are struggling with the same thing. It's like, no. Um, but it was just really, not to use this, this word as overused, but it was really organic, you know, because my, when I got saved, I mean, everyone, it was crazy. Like, I, just people in my church would rally around me and support me and love me. And I would get text messages from strangers all the time from my church saying, hey, Becca, this is so-and-so, I'm praying for you. I'm like, what? Like, that's crazy. And my pastor would meet me once a week for coffee, no pressure. And, um, <laughs> and he really poured into me. And um, so, I, yeah, I had such, like, amazing, they were so amazing to me. Awesome. Thank you, Beckett. Well, at this time, we are going to uh, pray, and then we'll sing one more song. Beckett's going to be out in the foyer. If you want to pick up his book, if you want him to sign the book, grab a photo, maybe ask him a question, he'll be out there for the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, let me pray, and then we'll sing our final uh, hymn, and we will uh, break for this Lord's Day. Beckett, thank you so much for joining thank us here you. all the way in Fayetteville. I know Fayetteville is not as cool as L.A. No, it's cooler. It is, oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> because of our church, huh? Yeah. just that cool of a church. Yes. Late, yeah, so Stephen Furtick can't do anything to us. <laughs> That's right. Hope he's watching. Now, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much uh, for your church. We thank you for this church. Father, we desire that this church is a healthy church for your glory. Lord, we know that we are not a perfect church and that we are growing in grace. And Father, I pray that that is our testament, that is our, our witness, that we are a church that is growing. We are not content to be the same Christians today uh, that we were yesterday, but we are looking back at the history of our walk with you and just seeing how your grace grew us in grace and in the knowledge of you. And God, thank you. Thank you for our brother Beckett who, who joined us this morning. May you bless him as he goes back to L.A. May you enrich him. May you refresh him. And just all the more expand your kingdom in and through uh, that brother. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Why don't we stand together?